Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Roger Altman, founder and chairman of Evercore. Roger, great to see you. Hi, Andy. How are you? Good, and thank you very much for hosting us here at Evercore. Um, I want to ask you about the firm that you founded in 1995. It's described as a global independent investment banking advisory firm. So what does that mean exactly? It means that uh, Evercore simply advises. No matter what we do, it's advising. So we're not part of a universal banking platform with lending, sales and trading, investing, currencies, and everything else, commodities. Uh, it's just an advisory firm. Now, it's a big one. Uh, I'm proud to say we, that we just had our 29th anniversary two months ago, and based on the latest quarterly data, uh, we're third in the world in terms of just total global advisory revenue. The main, main firms in this are publicly owned. They break this out very specifically. The data is clear. So after 29 years, that's pretty good. But we don't, uh, we don't lend money. We don't invest, uh, whether it's block trading or any other type of investing. Uh, and we don't uh, uh, use a balance sheet in anything that we do. Uh, so it's a, it's a pure advisory firm of the type that was quite widespread many years ago. And there are others like us around, uh, but we're the largest of the advi independent advisory firms by a lot. I know you said, Roger, that when you founded the firm, those 29 years ago, that there was no epiphany a la Steve Jobs and Dave Wozniak like Apple. But you must have had some vision in mind, and you had this just giving advice vision in mind, right? Did you map it out on a napkin well, or something? Well, keep in mind, the idea, Andy, of a, of a pure advisory firm is an old idea. Indeed, it's an ancient idea. Uh, uh, when I started in the business so many years ago, there were a whole series of firms that just did that. They've long gone, but they were firms like Dylan Reed and White Weld and Blythe Eastman Dillon and uh, Kuhn Loeb and so forth. So it wasn't uh, an original idea at all. We had a conviction that there was a serious market opportunity for a new one. Fortunately, that proved correct. Right. It is, has it surprised you that it's turned out the way it has, maybe bigger than you thought, or is yes. this exactly what you imagined? No, no, I don't want to claim any credit there. Um, we didn't have, the three of us that founded the firm, um, although my other two co-founders had, had left a long time ago. By the way, they're both in the nonprofit sector and doing very well. But um, there was never a, a vision that Evercore would become as large as it has. Uh, we had in mind a medium, small to medium-sized hopefully very, very high quality advisory firm of the type that had existed 20, 30, 40 years earlier. And the market opportunity just proved a lot bigger than we thought it might. Uh, and a lot of events explained why it became bigger, but it just did. Right. People talk about um, instilling culture at a company. A lot of people talk about the culture here at Evercore. How do you really do that though? Well, first you have to have a, a passionate commitment of your own to start. Um, and I had worked in three other organizations before Evercore. Um, and uh, one was Lehman Brothers, one was Blackstone, and I had two tours of duty in the U.S. Treasury uh, over seven years uh, and six years. and. I had developed a real sense of what not to do culturally. Uh, because uh, Wall Street firms, especially investment banks, are notorious for rough and tumble cultures, lots of fiefdoms, lots of favoritism, lots of turnover. And um, while I liked the business ever since I came into it, I didn't like that stuff at all. So the question became, how to, how, to, how to organize a new firm that doesn't have any of that? And we literally sat down and wrote a list, or made a list, of the types of, of the factors that created, in our view, those difficult cultures, and vowed to avoid every one of them, 
in starting with not naming the firm after ourselves and not reserving any rights of any kind, legal or otherwise, to the founders. But I could go on and on about this. Compensation was part of it, maybe? Well, the, in, only in the sense that we wanted to have one transparent compensation system encompass the entire firm. No multiple compensation systems, no departments paying themselves out of their own results. None of that differentiation. Everybody's on the same system. It's transparent. It's simple. And we're going to stick with it. But the uh, direct answer to your question is, uh, it's a version of Andy Grove's famous comment that only the paranoid survive. Uh, if, if you're not fanatical about it and you get to our size today, and this, we're not, you know, we're not Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan, but we have 2,300 people. If you're not fanatical about it every single day, preserving the culture, avoiding things that undermine it, including on the, the way you hire people and who you hire, you'll lose it. And so it's, honestly, it's a, it, it requires a level of passion, probably bordering on fanaticism to keep it. But it's been probably the single most important reason we've been successful because people want to work here. And once they're here, they like staying here. So if you can believe this, because it's so unusual, if you define turnover as someone at our senior managing director level, our senior level, leaving here and going to work for a competitor, mm -hmm. over the past five years, we haven't had any, zero, none. Most firms have five to 10% a year. Right. The stock, your stock has outperformed the market over the past decade. In particular, it's outperformed over the past two years or so, sort of extended the run or increased the run and it's beaten big firms, MS and GS, and those smaller ones that you mentioned as well. Why is that? <laughs> well, if I really understood the market, Andy, we'd be having this conversation on my very large yacht off the coast of Greece or <laughs> right, something, right. but I don't, and there is no yacht. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think investors see us as having a major growth opportunity from here, and they're right about that, mm -hmm. because to these days the market seems to pay more for growth, especially revenue growth, than for anything else. Not just for Evercore, for Procter & Gamble or whoever it may be. Um, and uh, we have been expanding quite aggressively from the point of view of adding people, and on the other hand, adding new functionalities in the firm, spreading ourselves further in terms of both uh, all the sectors we now cover from an investment banking point of view and then geographically around the world. And I think investors see us having a pretty, uh, pretty clear path toward continued growth, although uh, none of us knows the transaction cycle and, and whether, whether expectations, which are clearly in the market, that 24 will be better than 23 and 25 will be better than 24, really will prove out that way. I think they will, but that's a bit of a variable because we don't control that. I saw that your advisory revenue growth on a Kager basis over the past decade was number one. Is that the biggest opportunity going forward? I mean, that's the core of the firm. What are the real opportunities for you guys? Well, first of all, just to be fair, mm -hmm. there are a lot of much, much smaller firms who probably have grown faster because it's easier to go from two to four mm -hmm. than from eight to yeah. 16. But among the major firms, that's right. true. We're really growing in all facets of our business. So I'll give you a couple of statistics. 10 years ago, roughly, 100% of our revenues came from M&A, which was our original business and remains our, our core business. Today, it's only 60%. And that's because, uh, and I got to give a lot of credit to Ralph Schlossstein, who succeeded me as CEO mm -hmm. and was CEO here for t roughly 12 years until a couple of years ago. Uh, we've added a whole series of capabilities we didn't really have. The biggest one uh, is equities, we're the only independent firm that believed it made sense to go into the equities business. Uh, we did that internally at first, then we acquired ISI. It's become 20% of our revenue, just equities alone. Uh, uh, private debt, uh, uh, tax advisory, uh, uh, restructuring. Uh, there's about 10 of these mm. that are not M&A and that now comprise 40% of my revenues, all of which have been added over the last 10 years. And I think investors think we can continue to do that. And I think they're right about that too. 
you mentioned Lehman Brothers. You worked there right out of school in the glory days of Lehman Brothers, completely different firm from the one that later went bankrupt, really. Is there anything about Wall Street, Roger, that is the same today? Yes, there are. There are a variety of things, but one that sticks out to me is uh, this business, investment banking, and I want to focus in on that compared to Wall Street as a whole, has always attracted very talented, intense people. That was the case in mid-1969 when I walked through the door of Lehman Brothers the very first time, and it's the case today. Uh, and so one of the reasons why I find this business so absorbing and endlessly interesting is because the, the quality is the quality of your colleagues and for that matter, the quality of those you're competing against. It's always been high ever since I've been in this business. Right, you mentioned serving uh, in the treasury uh, a couple times. And what is it like to go back and forth between Wall Street and government, number one? And number two, what's the difference between public service and the revolving door, which is to say a positive and a negative? <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's take the first part of your question first. Um, I, I think government service, at least of the type I was lucky enough to have, is really very different than this business. Hmm. Um, and honestly speaking, it's a lot harder. This is a hard business. Uh, and it's a really intense business and deeply, you know, fiercely competitive. But it's not as hard as serving at a senior level of the U.S. government in the modern age. Hmm. Um, and one example of that, but we could have a whole separate conversation about this, is typically in our business, you're dealing in a bilateral context if you're working on a merger. You're representing the buyer or the seller, and you're, you have another party on the other side. Uh, in government, I'll just use my own experience, you have about, you're playing about a five-sided chess game. Uh, you have the Congress, you have uh, the White House, you have the press, you have the interest groups, whatever the issue is, mm -hmm. uh, and you often have foreign parties. Uh, and, I, and probably there's a couple of others I should mention. And you have to keep them all moving forward or at least under control. And it's just fundamentally more complicated. Um, and uh, it's, definitely, it's much harder, as everybody who follows this can see, to get serious things done in government than it is in this business. And what about this notion of revolving some people door? saying it's a revolving door, other people say it's a great thing that you're doing public service? Honestly, the people I have served with and, 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 and know today, because I happen to be pretty close to the Biden administration, um, don't, don't, don't qualify for the term revolving door. They're not there for that. Uh, I know there have been people over the years that have seen government service as a way to fatten their wallet when they leave or, or, or just as a stepping stone on the way to a different, a better private career. I didn't serve with people like that by and large, and I don't think there are people in this current administration at senior levels that have that mentality. So I'm not really, I'm not really, uh, uh, I'm not really big on that, that term and that, mm -hmm. or that factor. You're a lifelong Democrat. You volunteered for Bobby Kennedy's campaign. You knew Bill Clinton at Georgetown, worked for him later on. What about people who say that it's an oxymoron to be a Wall Street banker and a Democrat. How can you square those things, or can you? Well, I don't buy that at all. To me, uh, being a Democrat means that you really place a priority on trying to improve the fortunes and the lot of people that are less fortunate than you are. That's what it comes down to for me. And there's nothing about investment banking that prevents you from having a passion for that. In fact, if you're lucky enough to succeed in this business, it gives you resources so that you can really act on that. But I don't find the two uh, inconsistent at all. Um, are there people in this business who only care about themselves and their own uh, earnings? Sure, like in any other part of the world. But if you're really passionate about certain values of the type I just mentioned, there's nothing about this business that makes it difficult for you to pursue those at all. And some, you know, I have a lot of friends in this business, of course, having spent so many years in it, many of whom are passionate Democrats and many of whom would also have the same answer to that question. 
What do you make of the political divisiveness right now? And, and what's your take on the upcoming presidential election? So I think the number one problem facing the country above every other one is this deep polarization that we all see. Um, I think it's a severe problem. Uh, I think it's deeply unfortunate. And I think it's going to be hard to get out of. Uh, it would take a long conversation between mm -hmm. us to go over all the factors that have given rise to this. And I'm not an expert at all uh, compared to people who study this really seriously. But no, that's number one. Um, and I don't think that we're going to get out of it soon. As far as the upcoming election is concerned, I think it's going to be very, very close. I mean, here we are uh, give a little less than six months away. Most polls suggest that. Suggest that. I just held a briefing here at Evercore over lunch today with a, a really, really serious opinion research expert. And if you had attended the same briefing, you'd say it's really going to be very, very close. Um, and honestly, it could go either way. I mean, I'm not, I don't have a conviction as to how it's going to turn out. Um, but six months or a little less is a long way. You know, in, in modern political terms, it's the equivalent of 60 years. So many things are going to happen. Some exogenous, whether it's Gaza-related events or Ukraine-related events or and, and other, other events that are closer to home, like economic data and the path of the economy and inflation and everything else. But it looks really close to me. Let me ask you about the economy then, Roger. What is your take on where things are right now? People anticipated a recession and they anticipated rate cuts. Neither one of those things have happened. I think there are two big stories about the economy right now. One is that in terms of growth um, and overall health, it's been resilient to the point of astonishing. So um, you just mentioned the, that earlier there was a view we might have a recession. Nine months ago, probably half of the leading macroeconomists were foreseeing that, by the way, here at Evercore. Our, our Ed Hyman, who I think is as good as anybody on earth, was also forecasting that. Uh, and instead, if you look at the first quarter we just had, and you strip out trade and inventory effects, which tend to normalize themselves over time, we're growing about 2.5%. I saw someone on CNBC the other morning saying we're actually growing right now at 4%. But, but we're, ha we're experiencing healthy growth. We have a 3.9% unemployment rate, continuing the longest streak below 4% in 50 years. Um, we have continued steady job growth. Most recent number was a little lower than the number before, about 175,000 new jobs this late in the recovery is pretty good. Uh, we have strong fixed investment trends in this country. Investment is strong. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a story of, of strength and resilience and the United States economy is the envy of the world. The other part, the other issue though, is the cost of living. and. When you look at uh, every imaginable public survey, you see that there's pu public anxiety over gasoline prices, grocery prices, uh, and, and shelter, housing costs, whether you rent or you own. And in fairness to that view, we, we had a once in a hundred year pandemic. It distorted uh, supply chains, it distorted demand dramatically. You know, remember people were stuck at home Mm -hmm. They were not able to spend on a whole series of things that were normal behavior, going out to have for a meal, taking a trip, whatever it was. But they were pretty liquid because they were still mostly employed and they were getting transfer payments from the government. So they spent on what they could spend, fixing up the house or buying a bike or a new grill or whatever it was. Demand for those types of hard goods soared. Supply chains couldn't keep up and they were beset by the pandemic themselves. Therefore, prices soared on hard goods, including, by the way, cars and used cars. Uh, it soared a lot, uh, just a classic supply-demand imbalance. Uh, then when the rest of the economy began to slowly open and you could go out for a meal or go to a movie or take a trip, there was such pent-up demand for those activities. People were dying to do those things naturally. The demand for them also outstripped uh, a lot of normal behavior. And so this, these higher prices bled into the rest of the economy. We're working our way out of that now. I mean, the, at the peak, we were seeing 9% inflation. Now in the most recent data, it's between three and a half and two and a half, depending on what's, what measure you want, CPIs, high threes, core PCEs, low high twos. Um, 
but people are anxious about it. And it's true that um, what $100 at Walmart for groceries bought three years ago, it doesn't buy today. That's true. Grocery prices are up about 20% over that period. And some people have seen their incomes grow by that or more. Uh, right now, real wages are going up, but not everybody. And also for the entire three years since the pandemic, three plus years, there was a period when, in, uh, when real wages were not going up. So there's tremendous anxiety over the cost of living. And I think that's the other story about the economy. And final question, Roger, what keeps you going and what are your plans? Well, uh, I find this business uh, consistently invigorating because uh, the technology of finance has gotten much more complicated, if I can use that term, and therefore the average client assignment has become much more challenging than it used to be. When you're doing it 10, 20 years ago, you think it's very challenging, and it was, but it's become a lot more challenging. And there are all kinds of trends today. I mean, shareholder activism being one example, which just were not around earlier. For example, the rise of private credit markets. Uh, I could just go on and on. This, I could name 25 aspects of finance that are important today that were not around 20 years ago at all. So I find it's constantly uh, challenging from an intellectual point of view. And even the same client, year, year, one year from another, has a different task and a different need than the last one. And you're surrounded, as we talked about earlier, by very, very high quality colleagues who always uh, keep you on your toes. Uh, and so I think walking away from the business, you go from a run to a very slow walk, at least to me. And I don't want to do that. Um, uh, Evercore has a lot of momentum, so we're, we're all proud of that and want to keep it up. Um, uh, I have a lot of other interests other than the firm, uh, uh, which are important to me, starting with my family, but beyond that um, series of boards I'm on, and uh, I feel very strongly about my own philanthropy and being doing it mm -hmm. intelligently. Uh, so um, I've been a very fortunate guy. You know, I almost died about several times because of medical problems, and I mean, I came close. And so, you know, I think every day is a gift and glad to be here and glad to be talking to you, Andy, because <laughs> the alternative would have been a lot worse. Well, that's nice to hear. <laughs> Roger Altman, chairman of Evercore, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.